Welcome again this evening to our Wednesday night service. We have pre-recorded this. It's July the 1st, and I trust you're having a great week. I really do. I trust you're having a great week with your family, and it's time of rest, and, and uh, I truly uh, hope and pray that you do. So let's go to the throne of grace, and we want to ask you to please remember praying for each other in the church, one another, that the Lord just keep us safe, put a hedge about us, and... Um, and so let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we glorify your blessed name. We praise your holy name for your goodness and mercy. And Lord, even during this time, you're still good. I thank you for that. I thank you for salvation, for your, uh, for your care. And I pray you'll put a hedge by our church and keep our folks safe, every family safe. And I pray, God, you bless them this week. Give them a, just a great week off and perhaps they're off from their job. And I pray you just give them a great uh, week off as we celebrate our freedom this 4th of July. And I pray, Lord, you just bless it richly just for your name's sake. Amen. All right. We want to be sure to invite you uh, back Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And... Uh, so now let's listen as Matthew brings his segment on uh, Different by Design. All right. Well, half the year is come and gone now. And um, thank you for tuning in tonight via the um, different media avenues the Lord has given us. And tonight what we want to do is uh, take a moment. I, I did want to introduce a new lesson via recording if we could help it. I want to review... Uh, the godly leadership, and I want to give you all 10 points in one setting tonight, but more of a condensed version, so you can, um, if you missed anything, you can run back and catch it up. We'll give you some of the main um, points there, and as we stated, a condensed version. And uh, so basically what we're studying is this thing of godly leadership, but much deeper. We've, we've talked about this thing of influencing others and how to do that in a right manner and a right way. Let me say this, young people, with the schedule and stuff around here, we'll draw this coming Sunday um, for this one. So if you're watching the review tonight, go ahead and get you another entry in and uh, text me that you watched it. And we'll add your name. We'll put you another mark down, give you another chance to win the drawing this coming Sunday. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us this. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And um, we open this up with the question, what kind of influence do you want to be? Um, basically saying we will make a choice um, with our influence, whether it will be good influence or bad influence. It is not a choice of having influence or not having influence. Um, and basically asking our young people, do you want your family to be proud of you? Uh, you want to be thought of as mature. And when I speak mature, I mean spiritually mature the, in the godly things. Um, so we understood this. Leadership is influence. When it really comes down to what we do as leaders, we're talking about influence. And we have godly leaders and ungodly leaders um, in this realm of leadership. And you have to pick one or the other. And we are the stewards of our own influence. No one else is going to give an account for the way that I handle my influence. Young person, nobody else will give an account for the way that you handle your influence. You will give that account solely to God himself. So basically the lesson we're covering is 10 basic characteristics of a person who desires to influence others properly. Uh, ten characteristics, and sometimes when we break them up into small segments, we may miss one or two, so we'll give you all ten of them here tonight, and like I said, in a condensed version. So number one, we studied a godly leader loves and serves Jesus and others as a life commitment. And the key verse there was 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake understanding that what our life is about is about the Lord and our leadership and our, if we are godly leaders, we're going to love, we're going to love Jesus, we're going to serve Jesus, we're going to love others, and we're going to serve others. And uh, as we uh, make that commitment through our life, spiritual leadership begins with deciding to love and serve others. 
and uh, basically understanding that the way up in the kingdom of God is down and uh, that the greatest is to be the servant. And uh, so number two, we studied a godly leader will focus on being a friend, not on having friends. And of course, Proverbs chapter 18 teaches us a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And we, we referenced in the day that we live, we are bombarded with the social medias of our day and the friends and the connections. And what has happened, we're focused on having friends, being liked and being accepted. And when in reality, we are to be as leaders, we make the decision to be a friend. We make the decision to be a friend. And Brother Howes, we referenced this, but made this, this, said this that if you've ever been my friend, you'll always be my friend. And if you watch how friendships are handled nowadays, that's definitely not the case. That word friend has been very uh, manipulated and distorted for sure. So then number three, we studied a godly leader will hate sin, but love people and respect everybody. Galatians 6, 1 tells us, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Um, the Bible is clear. Young people, we're to use discernment when we're in our relationships and doing, uh, choosing who will be influenced by, who we will influence. We choose that, and we must make the decision and pray for discernment in those things. The Bible tells us we're to avoid wrong company. And bad influences. However, we do that at the same time of loving and respecting all people. And unfortunately, we, we run on two extremes generally. Generally, we're all in, head over heels, whether it's right or wrong, or we pull all the way back, running away, and we gut somebody or something while we do it. And that's not how we have to live our lives. We, we can find balance in the Christian life of loving and respecting all people, and yet not selling out our standards, Bible doctrine, and truth. It is a possibility to find that balance. So godly leaders are able, they develop the ability to hate the sin, and speak against it while at the same time loving the person and admonishing them to choose right. You perhaps have heard it put this way, you hate the sin, but you love the sinner. And uh, we must be, be reminded of that, that God loves the world. You realize when John chapter 3 and verse 16, when he said, For God so loved the world, he's not talking about the ball of dirt that he created. He's talking about you and I. He's talking about those that are on the other side of the, the continent and around the world. And, and no matter uh, race, background, history, any of those things, God said he loved the world. And we are to find what God, following God's pattern, agree with God on sin, but also agree with God on loving. And so we understand that we'll be able to hate the sin, speak against it, but express love at the same time. The Bible puts it, speaking the truth in love number four a godly leader will stand for right and does not fear ridicule a godly leader will stand for right and doesn't fear ridicule second timothy chapter three says yea and all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution and uh, we established that if we live this life and if you've not been convinced of it but christianity is under attack like never before and the battle is raging for this thing of our Christian beliefs and Christianity as a whole. It's much deeper than uh, anything else. I, it's, it's amazing to see the battle that's raging. And we must realize if we're going to stand for right, ridicule will come. Not everybody's going to stand by and applaud you young person as you choose the right path and doing the right things. But understand this, by God's grace, not by our strength, not by our own willpower, but by God's grace, a godly leader will not be surprised or moved by ridicule. Now, I love God, and I love God. I said this tonight. We studied this the first time. The fact that God does not sugarcoat it. He's not there trying to coax us in like a salesman trying to sell us a car. He comes in. He says, you will suffer persecution. And so we needn't be surprised when the ridicule comes. But the, pro the difference is, if we're a godly leader, 
we've been with God long before the ridicule has showed up. And so we, we, we stand for right and don't feel rid, fear ridicule. Then number five, a godly leader finds success in helping others grow and succeed. First Thessalonians chapter 5, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. A godly leader's success is not in building a bank account. It's not in building a corporation or in building a large business or whatever it may be. A godly leader's success is in helping others grow and succeed. A godly leader is interested in building others up and not tearing them down. An insecure person is interested in tearing people down. But if we find our security in our Savior and in Jesus Christ, we won't be alarmed when we help others grow and build them up. Godly leaders will willingly sacrifice personal rights for the privilege of influencing and helping others. Number six, we studied a godly leader learns how to communicate well. A godly leader learns how to communicate well. Hebrews 13, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Leaders learn to speak well. And leaders also learn to write well. And young people, in the day that we live, we were really challenging you that every form of communication, whether spoken, written, in a text message, in an email, social media platform, however it's done, is we are accountable for that and we're a steward over that, whether we use it for good or for bad. Number seven, we studied that a godly leader has a personal commitment to personal growth. A personal commitment to personal growth. Second Peter tells us, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And godly leaders decide that personal growth will be a lifetime journey. They're going to continue to grow and grow in the Word of God and by different um, other influences in their lives. But notice this about godly leaders. They value growth more than they value personal pleasure or fun. One of the reasons we are struggling with the maturity thing in this generation is because we are in the pursuit of pleasure and fun instead of betterment and in the, in the growth of our leadership. Young people, the reason you're treated as an immature individual is because you are pursuing the personal pleasure more than your personal growth. Nothing wrong with pleasure. It's all about how you prioritize it. It's all about the value that you place on each one and which takes priority in your life. And so a leader gives his mind and heart to strengthening influences, not depleting ones. And then number eight, we studied a godly leader learns to live a well-ordered and balanced life. First Corinthians tell us, tells us, let all things be done decently and in order. And basically put, leaders lead themselves first. Leaders lead themselves first. And again, very clearly stating the fact that the hardest person you will lead will be yourself. Will be yourself. And then when you move down this realm of, of influence and leadership, it becomes harder and harder. You lead yourself. And then one of the great challenges you'll find, young people, is when it's time to, uh, if you're ministering to your family or those around you that are closest to you because they see your flaws. And they, they say your weaknesses because they're close. But you simply must understand we have to lead ourselves first and work to grow by the grace of God so we can reflect the character of God in our life. And then number nine, we studied a godly leader cares about a good name and a godly testimony. Proverbs 22 tells us a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. And we understand that godly leaders value, I want you to listen, we, we made this statement just the other night, values what others think of them as unto the Lord. Not what they think of what I have or what I wear or if I'm prestigious or my personal vanity, but what they think of me because that's what they're going to think of the Lord. What do I bring to the table, so to speak? What do I display in my life that they look and say there's something different about him and that we represent the Lord well? 
Ungodly leaders choose to abstain from the appearance of of evil in order to protect their privilege to influence others. And then lastly, number 10, we studied a godly leader is destination oriented for himself and others. He's got a destination in mind. The Bible tells us I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. A godly leader wants to get there. A godly leader has a life pursuit. And that life pursuit is not money and power and position. That godly pursuit is people and helping others. And a godly leader is focused on helping others run their race well for the Lord. And as we conclude our review tonight, there is great joy and happiness in helping others succeed, in serving others, and having their best interests at heart. Thank you for listening. Amen. Amen. We appreciate that. That's good stuff. All right. Uh, we're going to have a song now by uh, Brother Joy and Miss Sarah. But uh, before they come to sing, let me just uh, say publicly, I want to appreciate all these that come to the church in different times to help us in um, recording all this. And... Uh, Making all this take place, those fellows in the sound room and those brother Joy, Miss Sarah coming and singing and playing, and brother Matthew and uh, just uh, everybody just messing up their schedule to come that we can record this and have a broadcast available for you. And, and I want you next time you see them at church, be sure to thank them. All right, listen gladly while they sing. have come and gone and his blood is just as strong and today it flows so free from the cross of Calvary found power in the blood and forgiveness for my sin And sweet peace to live within. I found eternal life secure, and my soul has been made good. Jesus gave me perfect love, found it all in the blood. Jesus was the sacrifice. No one else could take his place. It was love that held him there. There's nothing like his saving grace. When they laid him in the tomb, Satan thought he'd steal his doom. On oh, that third Day. The angels rolled the stone away. I found power in the blood. I forgive it for my sins. Found a refuge from the storm. As we breathe with me, I found it. Thank you very, very much. Good song, good song.
you have your Bible tonight, turn if you would, to uh, uh, Psalms chapter 6. Psalms chapter 6. And um, I'm thinking about a title for this psalm. If I, uh, if we were in a um, very sophisticated realm, I would tell them message, being exhausted. Uh, but since we are here in Granite Falls, North Carolina, and I believe everyone will understand this, I'm going to title it, Worn Out. Have you simply just been worn out? Turn if you would Psalms chapter 6 and verse number 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning all the night. Make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eyes is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. That word ashamed means to be disappointed. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll take this message and perhaps there'll be someone listening. And Lord, physically, emotionally, spiritually, they're just tired. And I pray, Lord, the message tonight would be an encouragement to them. We would lift them up and encourage them. For in the Word of God, we find a man that found himself in that same, same place. And yet, not only he found himself in that place, but praise God, he found a remedy for that place. And may we see the remedy tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Lest we misunderstand the power of just being worn out or just tired beyond imagination. In 1812, Napoleon controlled most of Europe from Spain to Russia. England controlled, uh, however, controlled the seas. Napoleon wanted to control India, which was then a British colony. But because of Britain's superior naval strength throughout the world, his only hope was to take India by land, which meant gaining control of Russia. 600,000 men marched toward Russia and when it was over and done, not a fire, not a shot fired, only 30,000 of this great powerful army survived. The fate of Napoleon's grand army was sealed by a simple fact. On the route to Moscow, the army passed through Poland and found the region was uh, uh, very diseased. The, the uh, people who lived there were, were infested, if you will, with lice and fleas. Uh, it, it was an unprecedented time for that place. And soon the men become, began to uh, collapse because of a disease called typhus 
which come from the fleas and the lice. And literally, they begin to suffer high fever and rash and delirium. And, and so, and in the end, Napoleon's army wasn't defeated by, by a Russian army. It was defeated. They were just simply worn out by sickness and, and the demands of the disease. In this passage of Scripture, we find David in a very sleepless night. The first seven verses of this psalm are one of the great cry of anguish. Three times, verse 2, 3, and 10, he used the word vexed. It means to be troubled, terrified, faint, and weak. In simple terms, it means he had been tossing and turning until he was simply worn out. My soul is also vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? And you, you feel the, the, the pain of his agony and, and his cry of how long that he uses 16 times in the Psalms. Here's the cry of a man who has hung on and held out, but now he's grown very, very tired. About ready to throw in the white flag of surrender. He's about ready to give up because he's simply worn out. I wonder, am I speaking to someone tonight? Because of all that's went on in the last 12 weeks around us, uh, you'd say, Pastor, I'm not only just tired, I'm sick and tired. Hey, I'd say, Amen. We've all been, this, this COVID 19 issue has been so exhausting. Mentally, we tried to wrap arms around a new normal. Emotionally, we're having to deal with the stress and the strain of doing things a certain way and trying to not um, trying to make sure we just do it right. Spiritually, trying to to find a, a to live our lives, juggle our responsibilities, and yet be faithful to God. In many cases, spiritually, having to to discern. The right, doing the right thing the right way. Well, what is the right thing the right way? And many times, for many, that is such a struggle. And uh, so we find that it's been very exhausting. So what do you do when you find yourself simply worn out? Now, I love this verse in Mark 6, 31. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart to a desert place. And rest a while. For there were many coming and going. And they had no leisure so much. As to eat. They, they literally. were so many people invading their lives. They didn't even have time to stop. And eat. Oh Vance Heavener said this. This is a must for every Christian. If you don't come apart. You will come apart. So I pray this week. As we celebrate this week of. Uh, of holiday and, and 4th of July and freedom that you'll come apart so you don't come apart. Amen. And so let's look at this passage tonight because not only do I want you to see the why that David was worn out, exhausted, tired, but I want you to know what to do when you're tired, worn out. And so I believe God's got an answer for every need of our life. Number one, we see the source of a reduced strength. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O oh Lord, how long? Well, what was bothering David? He's run down mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, and physically. Well, David's just like you and I. His body was well, he, his body was simply tired. He said on one occasion in Psalms 22, 15, My strength is dried up like parched, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me to the dust of death. So notice with me what caused this reduction of strength. Number one, the demands of service. Psalm begins with Psalms. Of David. David was a hymn writer. 
David was king of God's people. And if you serve well, it takes strength. And if we're not careful, we can get tired in the demands of service. Even where today we're seeing more of a challenge. The demands of service are more challenging today than they have ever been. We're doing things we've never done before. <laughs> Who would have ever dreamed we would have drive-in church? I mean, if you told me that two years ago, I would have told you, oh, you're kidding. Uh, the drive-in theaters uh, down the road, that, that was years ago. And, and now that has become on some places a very normal. So drive, but, but the service, the, the service to accomplish that, very demanding. We have found out here at the church that it is it has put a lot of demands on the people that run our sound and, and on the equipment. And, and we found in some cases that our equipment was very outdated, so we're having to improve it. So the ideal is the demands of service. In Exodus chapter 17, the Israelites were facing a fierce enemy, the Amalekites. The Amalekites were such a wicked people the Amalekites didn't kill to spoil the people. The Amalekites killed for sport. They were known for killing for sport. And they would attack just for something to do in the sport of it. And Joshua led the people in a battle. And Moses uh, went up on the hill with Aaron and Hur. But notice what he said. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand... Amalek prevailed, but Moses' hands were heavy. See, regardless of whatever your demand of service, it become you'll get tired. Those that serve in, in our restaurants now and, and even in the service industry where we shop, where we do our banking business, uh, they've all, the demands of that service has excelled. It's not the normal now. It's excelled. And, and just like going through the bank, you, most of us do it through drive through So that's somebody running back and forth. Just the demands of service. Someone said, Mary had a little lamb. It grew to be a sheep. It then became a pastor and died from lack of sleep. I don't know about that. I want to get tired in the work. And I do get tired in the work, but I want to never get tired of the work. I love serving God. I love serving Solid Rock Baptist Church. I love serving our people. But notice the demands of service. Notice the disability of sickness. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. That word weak means he was literally sick. Now, we don't know why he was sick, what, what kind of sickness. Psalms 102.4 says, My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so I forget to eat my bread. Literally, he was saying, I was so sick, I didn't even feel like eating. So the reality is, in this passage, he's very sick. We don't know what it is. But you know, when we get sick, the disability of sickness it's a very vulnerable time for us. Number three, notice the damage of sin. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul, save me from thy mercy's sake. David become consumed with the thought of his 15 minutes of pleasure, the heartache, the price he had to pay for that sin. Hear me, please hear me well. You can make one decision. And the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. You can make one decision. Have 10, 15 minutes of pleasure that you'll end up paying for the rest of your life. David ended up having to pay for this. He was grieved him. It, it, it was a... It, it was a, a Hard for him. It brought about, it, it, it sucked the strength out of him. The guilt and, uh, of having to carry that around. And the reality of the damage of sin. You need to understand, 
Uh, someone has said, sin will take you further than you ever planned to go, keep you longer than you ever planned to stay, and cost you more than you ever planned to pay. So the reality is, sin is, is a very devastating thing. Psalms 31 10 said, My life is spent with grief, and my youth with sighing. My strength faileth because of my iniquity, and my bones are consumed. His body runs to escape the shadows of his guilt, but he cannot outrun his own mind. Ephesians 4, 26, Be angry and sin not, and not the sun go down upon your wrath. Keep you, someone said, keep short accounts with God. Then notice with me, fourth, the, the devastation of sorrow, and all it demands of service, disability of sickness, the damage of sin, but the devastation of sorrow. Listen to the words I am weary with my groaning. All the night make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Can I just give you this translation? Man, I've cried all night long. I wept all night long. He was so broken. He was broken by the conviction gripping his soul. And I think he was cheerful about the many losses in his life. See, he lost his best friend, Jonathan, a newborn baby son, two other sons, a daughter was molested by a brother. Man, all that stuff just come on him. It was brought about a lot of sorrow. And then I want you to notice the fifth one. And, and keep all these other four things in mind. Because the fifth one plays a big part. The devices of Satan. We need to understand something. But mine eye is co consumed because of grief. It waxes old because of all mine enemies. Satan doesn't play fair. He knows exactly when to move in and bring his attack. And he'll catch you when you're on the bottom. When you spend all night crying. When you're worn out. When you're sick. When you're tired. That's when he'll attack. That's when he'll move you to make decisions that will devastate your life. Because that's his goal to begin with. Yeah. Devil knows he doesn't. Play fair. I would to God we got a hold of that. Satan does not play fair. And he's no respecter of moments. He could care less when you're at your lowest point. He could care less when your world just crashed. He could care less when everything's going wrong in your life. He could care less when you're on the bottom. He could care less when you're at your sickest moment. He could care less. We need to understand that. And David did. I am weary with my groans. But notice not only the source of reduced strength, but notice the signs of receding strength. There were some signs before he got there. And if we can see the signs, we don't have to get there to that place. Verse number five, for in death there's no remembrance of thee in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? And notice what David. David has gone from despair in his circumstances to despairing for his life. He's not only losing sleep, but he's losing interest in living. Wow. Satan's method is use a small daily pressure, the problems to tap against our soul like a Chinese water torture until we give in and give up. During the Last Supper, Jesus told Peter, and Satan had desired, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you that you, he may sift you as wheat. He wants to kill you. He's, he's asked me, let me have him, I'll kill him. Notice the warning signs in Peter's life before he got there. Number one, our praying becomes silenced. 
Just an hour ago, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's went a little further. He said, hey, boys, I want you to stay here. Matter of fact, he took Peter, James, and John a little further than the other 12. He said, boys, stay here. Play for me. Play with me. Let's watch him pray. He goes and he pours out his heart. And you know the story. Uh, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thy will be done. He comes back. And he finds them sleeping. When they should have been praying. Their playing has become silenced. He goes again. Wakes them up. He says, fellas, listen. Now's the time for us to play. We need to be playing right now. He goes and prays again. Comes back. And he finds them sleeping again. Then he says, the enemy's come now. Just... Sleep on. Now's the time coming. So, praying was silenced. Let me help you a little, tell you a little secret. One of the ways, one of the greatest remedies for being worn out is just praying. It is work, but it's a refreshing work. Because you, when you pray and you begin to see God move and answer prayers and it gives you strength. And the next time and the next time, then no matter what you face, you know that you can run to God. And he's the answer for whatever comes in our life. Samuel Chadwick wrote, prayer turns ordinary mortals into men of power. It brings power. It brings fire. It brings rain. It brings life. It brings God. Our plan becomes silenced. Number two, our performance becomes spiritless. When Jesus concluded his praying in the garden, soldiers came to take Jesus. And one of them, the soldiers grabbed him, Peter, pulled out his sword. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the right priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. I want to be sure you understand this. God went in a thousand miles of that. No doubt Peter had a not desire to do it. He meant well. He's in good intentions. But see, that was all done in the flesh. And there's nothing more that will drain you of your strength than serving God in this old wicked flesh you were robed in. We've got to have the spirit and the power of God. The world is waiting for a demonstration of Christianity that cannot be explained apart from God. Let me tell you that again. This world is waiting for a demonstration of Christianity that cannot be explained apart from God. Amen. If you can explain it, God's probably not in it. But if you know those things in your life that you just cannot explain, hallelujah, that's God. Hudson Taylor said, many Christians estimate difficulty in light of their own resources. And thus they attempt very little and they always fail. All God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God. Because they reckoned on his power and presence to be with them. Wow. Wow. Our praying becomes silenced. Our performance becomes spiritless. May I say our profession becomes secretive. In Luke chapter 22, they carried Jesus off. Peter's woman is falling afar off. Swarming his hands around the fire. Little maiden said, Aren't you one of them? And that's what he said. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. When we get to the place that we start being ashamed of who Christ is, we, we, when we come to the place that we won't, we won't readily Share with something the goodness of God. Getting secretive in our profession 
Man, that's a good sign. You're headed for getting worn out. When we do anything, when it, you know, there's nothing about this flesh that you're robed in wants to take a stand for Christ. There's not another thing. I'm telling you, we, we witnessed to, to everybody in Road Hits, and we knocked on every door in Road Hits and Granite Falls and, and a good portion of Hudson. And I'm telling you now, there's nothing in this flesh that likes knocking on that door. Nothing. But I want you to know something. When our profession becomes secretive, then we're headed being worn out. 48%, I've read this, 48% of regular church goers said they've not watched any church online in the last four weeks. 40% of church goers report watching their home church online. And this is a little bit unnerving, but 23% said they streamed different churches instead of their regular church. I want you to know if you're watching this now, you better be watching ours first. Amen. Oh, just throwing that out. Just saying. Source of renewed strength. The signs of receding strength. But notice with me, the simplicity of a, new, of a, a renewed strength. The source of renewed strength. Signs of receding strength. But the simplicity of renewed strength. In verse 8, something happened. The psalmist stood up and he made a proclamation. Something's happened in his heart. I believe the psalmist has said, I'm tired of living like I'm worn out. I'm tired of living in this place of crying all night. That's what he did. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Notice what happened. For the Lord. Now it's no more David. Don't miss this. He's not talking about himself. For seven verses, he's talked about himself. Been all about David. How hard he's having it. What a trial he's in. How bad he feels. Notice verse number 8. But the Lord. Now he's talking about someone else. But the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. You know what he's saying? He said the Lord's heard me. That's all he needs to hear. He said the Lord knows where I'm at. I love the Lord. I've heard my supplication. And the Lord will receive my prayer. Notice what he said. For the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. All of a sudden, he's moved from David to the Lord. And that's the simplicity of not being worn out. Is exchanging our strength from our strength to his strength. It's just simply acknowledging the Lord. Wow, the transition is abrupt like flipping a coin. One moment David's overwhelmed with trouble, and the next he's marching forward in triumph. He had come to a place of rest. Now, one of the great truths and promises in the Word of God is found in Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord... I should have just told this. The Lord's the answer. Because he is. I'm glad I'm saved. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm saved. But I want you to know something. The Lord's more than salvation. The Lord's more to me than just salvation. The Lord's more to me than just going to heaven. I'm not waiting till I get to heaven to enjoy this thing. I want to enjoy the trip because I'm trusting in the Lord today. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. There's a promise of rest. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. 
Genesis 2, 2, in the seventh day, God entered his work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. There's a provision of rest. Thou remainest, Hebrews 4, 9, thou remainest therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, the Lord's rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as the Lord did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if you can't learn to enter into his rest, then you're probably going to stumble along this thing. We need to enter into his rest. Nice, the peace of rest. Five, Jeremiah 31, 24, I have satiated the weary soul. I replenished every sorrowful soul upon this I'll wait, and behold, my peace was sweet to me. Isn't that good? He said, in the end, my, my, my peace was sweet. Peace does not mean a retreat from the world. We're, we're stuck in this world till the rapture comes, or Jesus comes, or we, or we go by way of grave. Either way, it doesn't make any difference. But I would favor kind of rapture myself. But regardless of either way, peace does not mean a retreat from the world, but a serenity which comes and remains, though the world outside the world may be in turmoil. It's simply this. Psalms 4, 8. I will lay me down in peace and sleep, for thy Lord hath only makest me dwell in safety. You know what he's saying? He said, I'm going to lay down and go to sleep. He said, if you're running the world, there's no point in me standing up and trying to run it. So I'll go to sleep and trust in you. The story is told of an exploring party in Africa which had employed a group of natives car native carriers to go with them into the interior. Being in a hurry to reach their objective, the party was pushed relentlessly for several days. Finally, the natives just sat down and would go no further. As what was the matter, the superstitious natives replied, We are waiting for our souls to catch up with our bodies. We are waiting for our souls to catch up with our bodies. I think a lot of Christians, a lot of God's people, especially a lot of the people in this world, are in that place. A lot of Christians have run away from God in their hurry and rushed for worldly things and need to stop and catch up on their spiritual things. My prayer is for our church tonight is that we, we cannot change. Let me, let me just help you. We cannot change what's going on in this world right around us. I wish we could. If we could, we, we would try to change some of it, but we can't. So what we can do, here's what we can do. There's two or three things. First of all, we can't purpose in our heart to serve God and serve Him faithfully. No, we can't have Sunday school now. No, we can't do the choir. No, we're not having patch club. No, we're not running our buses. But you know what we can do? We have three services a week. We can be faithful to all three services. And may we, may, we do, may we do all we can for God's glory. During this time, you can't go visit a lot of people, but, I'm, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can call them up, encourage them. You can call them up and, and witness to them for a loss. If you've got a family member that's lost, that more, what a wonderful time now to witness to them and tell them about Jesus. And then thirdly, we can pray and ask God give us what we need during this time that we don't miss what he is doing. That's my prayer for Solid Rock Baptist Amen. Church. I don't want to miss what God's doing right now around us worrying about what the world's doing. I'm not worried about the governor and what all these politicians around are doing. They just need to do what they think is best. But I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Do it the very best I possibly can. Miss Sarah, you come play for us. While she comes to play, plays, I trust if God spoke to your heart.
that you would just ask the Lord to help you. He'll stream. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the privilege to be able to broadcast by way of radio and YouTube and <clears throat> live streaming. All these different modes <clears throat> of getting the gospel message out. But Lord, may we not use that. Now tonight we're not at the church. Tonight we're not. But Lord Sunday, Lord's willing, we'll be at the church. May we not miss the opportunities we have given to us. May we be absorb all the opportunities. And let nothing stand in the way of us enjoying the opportunities that's given to us while we can. I pray, Lord, you'll bless this, thy people. I pray you'll renew the strength of those that are tired and, Lord, just simply, like David, just worn out. Right? But that, that was just part of the story. Because at the end of it, David recognized his strength was in the Lord. May we understand tonight our strength is in the Lord. Not just saved us, but he's our strength, our shield, our buckler. For this time that we're in now, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.